Hi everybody, uh, hope you are all doing well and welcome to this uh, probably very technical stream about how to add like a new hardware platform to the Mission Pinball framework. Um, yeah, I guess we will like work from top down. So we will first like talk about how hardware abstraction, abstraction works in general in the Mission Pinball framework. What's basically our general concept there. And then we will like go go down a little bit to how this actually looks for different like types of devices we call it devices like switches or coils or um yeah like lights i guess we will look into those three and uh, yeah afterwards we will talk like what else you need what else is there and so on and um yeah so i would say let's uh get started so this is our agenda today um so first we talk about like general abstraction and then we yeah that's that's basically what i just said right then we talk about like which interfaces do we have in mpf um then like Something is like, what if you got something which, which is specific to your platform, which is like, I don't know, you build, I don't know, better lights than anybody else, and it can have, for example, UV or something. I mean, yeah, that might be something which wouldn't fit like RGB lights. So what, what can you do? So how would do you add support for that in NPF? Um, then like. How do you like validate the configuration of your of your platform? I mean, otherwise, like we will get like complaints from users which are just configuring stuff incorrectly and wondering why it's not working. So usually we try to validate that that generally makes sense that you only can can configure hardware which is actually there. Um, and yeah, I will. We will talk about that, and at the end, like it's like how do you register your platform? So how does MPF know that which platforms are there? So how does it know that, and how can you add your platform? And um, then we will like look into the actual code, how this looks for some platforms. Uh, if you want to know specifics, just ask. Um, in a lot of for, for a lot of devices there are like very different ways how they can be like controlled in, in hardware so um there there are usually like 10 ways for 10 platforms i mean no that that depends a little bit but um the details are often very very unique unique to some platforms so um yeah let's let's get started with like how like how this this works in general so this um i made a small picture to just to draw down the mental picture of how hardware abstraction works in mpf so the idea is that you got like devices and there are some devices which are only like logic so like a counter is also a device in mpf which uh, consumes events and probably emits events so that's not connected to any hardware but um, other stuff like switches for example they are basically backed by hardware and since this hardware can look like differently we somehow need to abstract how this hardware looks to the user because like a user thinks of a switch as a switch it's just a switch and there are tons of details how this is different in hardware so like how do you debounce it um how do you prevent it from machine gunning and stuff like that but the user usually does not care about that and as long as the switch works the user doesn't care so um we got like the high level switch here that would be the device on the left and that's what the user configures in his config and this switch this logical switch device in mpf that 
then called like a method in the hardware, which is called like configure switch. And that should return like a hardware device. And that's basically something which is platform specific. So like there's like a switch, a P-Rock switch, and there's a, like a fast switch, and there's an open pinball project switch. And for every platform, there's basically a different switch implementation. And those hardware switch devices, they all confirm to the same interface. And that's basically the platform device interface, basically for, um, for example, this is the platform switch interface. And additionally, like the platform itself, uh, like that also like needs to implement a certain interface, which then contains this configure switch method. And um, in some time, some places also like a few more methods which need to be there so that the logical devices can actually speak to this um, platform, so this hardware platform. And that's the general idea how we um, abstract hardware and MPF. Then the platform itself, usually, I mean, for, from MPF perspective, that's a black box. It just gets this magical switch device and it will call methods on this magical switch device. And internally, most platforms got like a USB or serial or something um, to talk to the actual hardware. And uh, that's, but that's basically up to the platform how that works. So. It can use like libusb and talk directly to USB, what some platforms do, or it can do like, it can be a C module, which can be linked into MPF, or it can also talk to a serial part to like FTTY uh, USB zero or something, um, or ethernet or whatever. I mean, you can really do anything. And um, there's basically also almost everything, anything in MPF, Hardware-wise, so <laughs> there are a lot of interfaces there. Um, but the beauty of this is that this is totally up to the platform how, how this works. Um, so that's the general structure. If you've got questions, feel free to ask anytime. Um, here, like the next thing is you got like those interfaces I talked about. And there are a few. Um, those are like what we got and the most common ones are like switches obviously so because you need switches in your pinball machine but we got like coils um, which you also need in all pinball machines so sometimes you have to somewhere you have to control like to your balls and how your your pops and flippers and everything and this interface also contains like hardware rules so that's to tell like if this switch activates automatically pulls this coil that's what you typically have for like pop bumpers so that the hardware will take care of actually um pulling this pop bumper and the reason is to to hide latency because if we would like have a usb in between like the switch it would occur then like it takes like 10 15 milliseconds until the signal travels over USB to MPF, and then MPF would send the pulse command that would take another, like, I don't know, three, five, ten milliseconds. And then it would be like 25 milliseconds, uh, roughly, but basically only an average. So that would be sometimes 15, sometimes 30, 30 uh, milliseconds. And the, the player usually notice if this just varies. So it ch should be really consistent, and that's why you usually have hardware rules for that. Um, you got like lights and um, lights is also like an interface which sounds super easy and like the, the logical interface is easy like set this light to a certain color but um, this is probably the interface which varies the most in hardware how it actually works because like i mean you you had like those you have gis which just turn on and off then you got like lights where you can tune the brightness. Then you got platforms which can actually support fades in hardware. So you can tell, turn this light to, to red in, I don't know, 100 milliseconds. Um, for example, not all platforms can do that. Some can do that. And that's like, um, especially with LEDs, that's important because you do not want them to flash. It just looks looks bad for the player so that's uh, why you usually want that 
we got servos, we got steppers, obviously we got segment displays, we got dot matrix displays, we got accelerometers. Um, like uh, they can do like leveling of your machine, and they can also to some extent to be used as tilt. So like they can detect hits or acceleration of the machine. Um, it's something um, which some platforms support. Then we got an I squared C platform that's like an embedded bus. Um, and that's like a little bit odd, but um, there are certain like chips which interface via I squared C and they, for example, uh, support servos. And now um, you can like have one I squared C platform, connect the your I squared C chip to this platform and then configure this this uh, server platform to use the other platform as i squared c for example the p3 rock has like an i squared c on it and you can use that to like then interface another platform so like they piggyback each up and there's like also use b to i squared c uh, controllers and stuff like that that, that can be uh, used like by the i squared c platform just because we got more hardware like accelerometers or anything else uh, which can then work with this I squared C interface. And we got like an external sound interface, sounds odd, but it's for like um, really old machines which have existing sounds, sound cards like the WPC, WPC, I don't know if that works, but like for older stuff uh, where you can just say play sound 37 and it will play sound 37. It's like for yeah some older machines. Uh, which do not have modern modern sound with a PC, uh, what you usually would want to use. And that's basically for compatibility. Some people want that. And so, so we did about that. Uh, so one thing which might be missing here is like a motor platform where you have motors, and that's something we might add in the future because we now got a few platforms which got that, um, and we currently do this via via drivers or via coils. So like we've got two coils for each motor direction and we do it in software, but some controllers can do that in hardware and we want to support that too in the future. Mm, yeah, that's basically a general overview of what we got. And now we will go like into the first three because those are like the most important ones, right? Switches, coils, lights, got so that, that's, that's Pimbo machine. <laughs> and all the rest is like um, important for some machines, but probably not for all of them. And not, it's also not so surprising how that works. So, um, like, uh, we will, like, let's see, go to the first one. So, the switches. The switches are important, obviously. And now we will, like, meet the first configuration method and that's like configure switch like in the method which you have to implement if you want to um yeah, if you want to like have switches in your platform and um, and that will basically return a switch object which does nothing really does nothing and it's like it's really more or less optical so that's basically just to let your platform know that mpf configured the switch because like some platforms have to actually tell their hardware that they want switches to, so that they want to know about switch changes, for example. Um, or maybe you can have like debound settings. Uh, some some platforms support debound set, setting debounds on switches and so on. But that's not something which is like mandatory. Like it's it's really like an empty empty device, um, like an empty object. And you can implement basically anything on it, what you want. I will show you in a minute because it's really small in most platforms. Then you need like an additional method on your platform, which is like get the hardware switches. So like get the initial switches because like when the machine starts up, there might be, for example, balls in the trough. And uh, in the trough there, then are some switches are active. And um, that's yeah, something MPF needs to know in the beginning. So it will initially read your switches. Um, then at during runtime, MPF expects you to notify the switch controller about changed switches. 
So usually you got like some loop to pull your switches or sometimes it's also like that the hardware actively notifies uh, the code via like some message. It might be unsolicited. So, um, but it, it's, it's up to the hardware, right? Some, hard, some hardware has to actually ask about switch changes, otherwise uh, others uh, notify it. And it's like sometimes it depends a little bit how you do like flow control on your serial protocol. Because like in a lot of protocols, there's like a master, which is usually the PC with MPF, and the slave only talks if the master asks him. It's tricky to have protocols where like both sides can co send commands at any time because then you need like state machines and stuff. And the, easy, the, the simple protocols typically are like the PC just asks every five to 10 milliseconds. And that's basically how the switch interface works. And we can actually look at that. Um, let me show you my IDE. So that's basically here, like that's the code. And let me know if it's too small. Um, that would be like interface, the switch platform interface. And um, that's basically what you need to implement. There's like one method is configure switch, which has like a number. So that's string. So whatever that means in your platform, MPF does not know. It will just give you this number and it expects you to like verify that this number is like confirms to your like format and um, is semantically correct. You will also get like some switch configuration and you will get like a platform config dictionary. That's something we will talk about later. And so now like the switch configuration is like the name, um, like the name of the logical switch. If it's inverted, that's typically like optos are often inverted in hardware. So and there's like an invert bit here or invert bool. And um, if it should be debounced or not. So like in MPF, the interface is actually not only it's debounced, yes or no. And like most, or not most, but some platforms support like fine, finer um, granulated like debounce controls or like debounce for one milliseconds or 10 milliseconds or 50, doesn't matter. Um, but not all of them do. So MPF only supports on and off. And what that technically means in your platform, that's also up to you. And uh, you can like, um, yeah, you can basically interpret that, but you should document what it means. And uh, you can have like more settings if you want. And that's like what platform config means. And but we will come to that later. So you might put the actual value there, but then it's like, it's not abstracted. It's something which is specific to your platform. And then you're supposed to return an object which implements the, plat the switch platform interface. And that's what MPF, what the logical MPF switch device will then use. Mm. Then there's like a, a validate switch section, which um, is used uh, like validate that um, your switch is valid. So that's super simple and it's already implemented for you. So you do not have to do that. But if you want to have like special stuff, you can add that. Uh, we will also later look at how validation works, um, but that's a method which is implemented for you. Um, and uh, then this is the other method I was talking about, get ha hardware switch states. And that um, expects like a dictionary, which is like the string, like the name of the switch um, with, with the state of the switch. So is it active or is it inactive? And that's what MPF will like call in the beginning. Um, in general, something which hey, you should understand is like um, a platform is like initialized like in three states. I should have I should have prepared a, a graph about that, and but I did. So first step is like the 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 class. So your your platform is implemented as a Python class that's initialized. So like init is called, and that's like 
where you can set up your objects, load your modules, and um, that's probably about it. So you shouldn't do like too much there because uh, MPF is not yet up at that point. So like it's loading all the classes, it might be like in random order, switches might not be loaded yet and so on. And then MPF does that, all that, there's like a little bit stuff here for like tell MPF which features are available in your in your platform. Usually you do not have to change that, but sometimes you can. And like has as servos, for example, and if you implement the servo interface, it will automatically set that for true, for example. Um, but uh, yeah, like there's like hardware uh, end of strokes which repulse support, for example, that's a flag you can set, and then MPF will use it. Otherwise, it will emulate that. But we will come to that. Um, and the second thing is like it called initialize. And that's like an async function. So if you know like Python async IO, um, what you should try to prevent at any time is like to block the thread. So you shouldn't like wait on IO in your code. Instead, you should like use async IO. That's like a Python way of um, like yielding control to the, the main program. And that sounds crazy, but it's relatively easy once you've seen how that looks. But that only works like in methods which are called, which are named async. Because then like the caller will also like wait on this result in an asynchronous way. And here you will like usually you connect to your serial port, you, you read initial switches, and you yeah, configure all your stuff. So that's running like in, in the beginning. And then um, all the devices are initialized. So like switches are set up and configured, servos are configured and so on. And at some point like then start is called. And start means now like everything is up and you should like start polling switches and reporting switch changes and so on. And there will be no like commands to your platform before start is called. Um, but like all the configuration of like switches, like the config switch method, for example, that would be called after initialization and before start. Um, and that's something to, to remember. There's like a few more methods which you could implement. For example, stop is nice. Uh, it, that's what it will be called when MPF is shutting down. So like if you, even if it's crashing, it tries to call stop on all platforms. And that can be used, for example, to so deactivate all coils, deactivate lights. That's super nice. Really do that because otherwise they will stay on. And um, when you're debugging over your machine and you stop software and everything is still up, that's not nice. Or like deactivate servos, deactivate steppers, and so on. So um, that's like really helpful if you just deactivate stuff. Uh, it prevents also hardware from getting damaged because. It's in some invalid state and MPF crashed. Um, there is like a tick method which you can use, but you can also use your own like um, coroutine. That's like something you can use in async IO in Python. So you can decide between those two. Um, and if like you're using the tick method, that's running by default. Otherwise, you can have set like the tickless function. Then this won't be called. It's basically performance optimization. Some platforms do not need to be uh, need, don't need a tick function because they are not polling because they're actively notif notified by hardware. Um, MPF. So MPF is the master and hardware the slave. It can be like that's if you if you use like the the tick function, then MPF is often the master and it will actively pull the hardware, but it does not have to be this say, this way. So you can set it to tickless and like just wait on I/O, and the platform will tell MPF what to do. We got let, got this for example with like um, virtual pinball, like the, this virtual pinball emulator. It will actually call in, into MPF. So there it's like the other way around. So both both ways work, so it's totally, totally up to you how this, how you implement that. 
Um, if I would if I would design a platform, I would probably go with master slave, MPF master and um, hardware slave, but you can have it both ways. So yeah, that's basically what you know want to know in general. There are like some methods like for um, firmware updates if you want to do that. It's like something if you call like MPF hardware upgrade, then it will call this method and tell your platform, yeah, please do whatever you need to do to update yourself. And then, yeah, you can run firmware updates, for example. There's also like um, get info string. That's something if you run like MPF hardware scan, that's what it calls. It, it calls get info string for all platforms and then aggregates that and gives the user a nice output about how this hardware actually, like, yeah, how it actually works and which switches are there. And I mean, it depends what the hardware knows about itself. Some hardware and some hardware boards are not aware of what they got. They just send out commands themselves, so they don't know. But a lot of hardware actually knows how many switches are there, how many coils are there, which state your switches have. I guess all platforms know which uh, states the switches have. But that's something which you would return there. So, but there, there's like a lot of stuff here which you can implement, but you do not have to implement it. Um, like usually MPF will tell you because there's like uh, methods which are unimplemented, and um, then it will complain. <laughs> so let's go into the agenda. So like that was basically how switches in general like work. And um, you can use like the this tick function, for example, to, to notify the switch controller. And maybe I will show you how that actually looks. It might make sense. Uh, so let's look, for example, in the Lizzie platform. That's, um, that's a platform which implements, mm, let's go here. So that's basically Lizzie platform. That's one of the platforms we support in MPF. And it supports like switches. It implements this implement interface, lights, drivers, segment display with software flash and hardware sounds because like it's like it supports like the older, yeah, the older WPC and um, Buckleap machines. And it implements all those interfaces. And um, for example, the switch interface, the one which we are talking about. And now we can like, let's like look into init. It does basically nothing here except like validating its configuration and setting up logging. So that's that's what it does here. Mm. And then later it does like initialize, that's this method. And here it will like connect to this U either via serial, um, which is like this line basically or via network, so it can do both. So that's one of the platforms which can either go via network to a remote Raspberry Pi, for example, or it can like run locally via serial if you run like the code on the Raspberry Pi itself. And um, yeah, that's basically how you do this in Python to await on this, on this future, how it's called in async IO. It does like some magic because yeah, it has to do some magic because if you there's certain bits in a serial, and if you toggle them, uh, 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 an Arduino will restart, for example. And there's some magic, and because there are so many implementations for Lizzie, so that's a protocol which is like implemented by probably five platforms at the moment. So there's a little bit magic ongoing here, but um, it's only optional for some platforms. And then this is basically where it starts. So it will reset the, the platform. So it will set general reset. Something which I would recommend if you create a platform um, is like have a define class. So they got like Lissy defines and that's like, they just define all their opcodes for their protocol or depending if you like got a binary protocol or a, um, or a string protocol, but it makes sense to have like a file where you document all your opcodes and then reference that. 
makes it easier to understand it. Um, the common baud rate um, depends a little bit on what it is. So like if it's a USB, then you can set whatever it is because if it's like an Arduino has an USB connection and it's not like a real baud rate, it's something you set and it's mostly ignored. So um, yeah, it will be like two megabouts or something. So it's usually really fast. For serial, it will be like between 115K and I don't know, for like Stern Spike, we go up to two and a half or three megabouts. So that's roughly the limit where it gets physically tricky for serials. But um, it depends. If you like want to have, you want to push data for DMD, you need like at least two megabouts roughly, or one and a half, two megabouts for even without colors. So with colors, you need like six, six megabouts or roughly. So it's, it's really a lot of data. If you just want switches or coils, doesn't really matter. Um, if you want lights, it depends again on your protocol on how how efficient it is. So like Stern Spike, the the bus in Stern Spike between all the node buses is only 115 kilobouts roughly. So that's really slow compared. But they do a good job in like packing all the bytes, and um, that way they can they we can they we can actually cope with it. But sometimes Spike actually really pushes it to the limit. So you can see that sometimes it's saturated. So if I were design it, I would like aim for more. So like one megabout, if I could, I would go with that. That should be fine for anything except like if you want to push a DMD over it. So like for lights, one megabout, that should be fine, even if your protocol is really verbose. Mm. So that's what I would recommend. And yeah, so like then they do like some some initialization here, read some strings and um, which version it is. So it's often useful to read like the API version or the the firmware version because then like if there's a feature which is only available in newer firmwares, then MPF needs to know because it should not use it in older firmwares but in newer ones. And that's also what they do here. And they set it to some machine variables in MPF. So like Self machine variable, set machine variable. That's just to set a machine variable. And then you can use it on slides or even in, in conditional logic if you want an MPF. So that, that makes it available for like the, the designer of the game. And that's also what they do. So then you can like put it into service mode if you want, for example. And they do like a lot of iteration here. So in, enumeration. So like they check how many lamps there are, how many solenoids, because like again, this is implemented by multiple platforms and they differ on how many switches they got. And then, yeah, there's, there's version depending stuff. Uh, so this, they do a lot of stuff. And at the end, they do this. So this is basically, uh, let, let's look here first. So they read the initial switches. So here they, they just iterate all the switches and send a command to get the state of the switch. And put this into like into a dictionary, and that's later used for to tell MPF when it asks which state those switches have. And um, yeah, there's also like a state where, I mean, this in Lizzy is this way: you can have like switches one to ten, and then or like one to eight, and nine and ten are missing, and eleven is there again. So it can tell um, MPF for a single switch that number 11 is or number 10 is invalid for example like on wpc you got like a 0 to 7 i think and then a 10 to 17 or something and there are some holes in the in the numbering and that's how they implemented it. it's one way to do that there, there are multiple ways and then what they do here like is they start a watchdog task and that's like something in async io where you can create a task like task which runs asynchronously in in MPF, and that's basically the watchdog task, which will then every like 500 millisecond tell the hardware, yeah, MPF is still running because most hardware platforms got a watchdog, and when the watchdog stops triggering, the hardware will turn off coils usually, and often they will also turn off high voltage so that 
nothing bad can happen when MPF crashes or the connection is lost or whatever. So that's, that's a good idea. And that's what they do here. And then initialization is done. Um, later there's like start. Start starts like a poll task here. So they don't use the tick function. They do this exactly the same. They cr create a new function which polls switches. And let's go into that. It's an async function, which is basically a, a huge while loop. And this while loop sends one command, switch get changed switches. You can imagine what it does. It just gives you if a switch changed, and if yes, which one. And uh, yeah, then it reads one byte um, because it just answers one byte, very efficient protocol. And if it's 127, that's the magical number, uh, which means there's no change, then it will sleep. And otherwise it will decode which switch actually changed and then tell like the switch controller here that certain switch with a certain number changed to a certain state. And that's that's it. That's all you need to do. And that will tell MPF that yeah, the switch changed and it will process all the do other events and notify everything. And, and that's that's it. And yeah, then there's like this. Let's see what is it. Uh, mm -hmm. ah, yeah. Get um, hardware switch states. That's basically the initial states, and it's super easy here because like we initially put this into like an, an, an array. And uh, we just return it. That's super simple. So that's like if you want switches, that's that's already it. <laughs> Basically done. Um, <laughs> and yeah. Uh, let's see what do we have next. So next we got like coils or drivers. That's interchangeable. So sometimes we call it drivers. Sometimes we call it coils. There's like a method which is called configure. Um, driver and that returns like a hardware driver object and that object actually has to implement a few methods and uh, that's basically because like the, the driver in MPF uh, it gets configures the hardware driver and then later it might call like pulse on this driver or it might call enable or disable and that's um, it's, I mean, it's a simple interface and you have to implement it. Additionally, like there's like a few methods to set and remove hardware rules. And that's basically to tell it like, well, this is like, this is your flipper coil and it's activated by that switch with that number. And if the player presses this, the switch and activate like this coil for like 20 milliseconds and afterwards turn on PWM at like 30% UT third cycle. And like there are, you know, there are like different types of flippers and machines with one coil or two coils. And they're like pop bumpers, which are also like uh, hardware rules and sling shots. And that's uh, where it actually ends, ends up. And we got like a few methods which you have to implement. I mean, you can also tell like, yeah, your hardware does not support this particular rule, but then MPF will basically prevent the user from configuring certain stuff. So that's something I will show you next. So like in, let's for example say, yeah, that's already here. Configure driver, that's like the method to configure a driver. It works really similar and so like we can we can probably look into a driver platform, basically the, the, the class itself, the base, the interface, base class. And um, it has like, yeah, one feature which you can tune that's basically the maximum pulse time. So some platforms can pulse for like 10 seconds and others can only pulse for like 100 milliseconds. So it's different. And most platforms do like 255 milliseconds. Um, and like if a user wants to pulse for like 
one second and your platform doesn't support that, then MPF will basically fall back to enabling that coil. It will enable the coil and set an internal timer to disable it after like 1000 milliseconds. So that's the reason for that. Um, so that you do not have to do that in your hardware platform. And there's like one method configure driver, which gets like again this driver configuration that looks like this. It has the name, the logical name, like default pulse milliseconds, default pulse power, default hold power, default recycle. It's basically how fast it could can re-enable um, after it has been enabled to prevent it from overheating by some errors. Maximum pulse milliseconds, maximum pulse power, and maximum hold power. Um, that's most of this maximum stuff they already already like checked in the hardware and in, in the logical stuff before it's passed to the hardware, but it's still passed to the hardware, so the hardware knows. And then you can get the number, which you can pass in any way you want, um, but use common sense and make it nice and like platform settings. And yeah, I'm just noticing that I talked a lot of a lot a long time and um, I'm only in the second one. <laughs> But uh, yeah, let's 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 just speed it up a little bit. So we got like clear hardware rule. That's basically the last thing you're using. So if you got you configured the hardware rule for a certain switch and coil, this is how you can clear the rule. So like if you disable the flipper fingers, you usually clear or MPF clears this hardware rule. So that's one thing you have to implement. And um, then there's like set pulls on hit rule. Sounds simple, right? Like you got an enable switch and you got a coil. And you tell the hardware, yeah, make a rule that when this switch is activated, that that coil is pulsed. Not enabled, just pulsed. That's for pop bumpers, for example. And there's like with delayed pulses, which you might implement or not. It's basically optional. And they're like with pulls on hit and release. There's like pulls on hit and enable and release. <laughs> like that's typical flipper. Um, and like there's another one for dual wound flipper. So that if you, you do not have to implement all of them, implement what your platform can do. Um, coin lockout coil. Can you give an example of that? A coin lockout coil. Um, I'm not sure. Do you enable that permanently or how does it? How does the thing work? Um, I would guess that it would be like a normal coil um, on your platform, and there, are, um, if you like, if you look at this configure driver, it will like it needs to return a driver platform interface, and that then has like this pulls enable disable methods, and you have to implement those. And you can use like any coil, and that um, okay, but that would be something which is then enabled. So like, so the way I understand it is, uh, you got a coil which is on your um, in your coin collector, and once like the once your credits mode tells you like you got maximum coins to reach, it it enables this coin permanently, and typically what it would do on this method is like it would call enable that has some initial pulse time which has again here pulse settings that's again um, some uh, yeah, dictionary with power and duration so like it's pulse it for 10 milliseconds and then you got some hold settings that's basically just the hold power and then UT cycle it with like 10% hold power and uh, so that would like close the coin slot or maybe it's the other way around and needs to be enabled to um, to be released and that's what's what would happen here right and disable the disable this call again so that's how that was that would work let's quickly look into like how this works in, in Lissy. so there's like configure driver and um, they do verify a lot of stuff on the numbering so that it, it's correct and it can be it can exist this way. Um, 
and then at the end they instantiate like an object which is a subclass of driver platform interface and there they implement everything so like configure recycle pulse ms pulse itself which actually it sends a command to the hardware which just has the number and previously it sends another command to set the pulse milliseconds for example and same for enable and disable so that's that's really simple i mean this is a small class here and um, it's like 50 lines of code so that's basically the, the the driver stuff where it usually gets a bit messy is like if you look at the um, set pulse on something like all the hardware rule stuff this is usually like huge messages with a lot of parameters um, let me find it configure hardware rules so um, this is the command in lissy where you configure hardware rules and that's like yeah it's always a lot of parameters in your in your command if you look at the same in, in spike it's i think it's like 50 lines or something so i mean we can actually do that <laughs> So like um yeah this is actually like this is the old yeah that's actually a, a, a rule in spike so like <laughs> they got like a, a lot of parameters internally and for some of them we do not even know what they do because we never have seen them used in in extra games um but that's how that works so just have a method which does that and we trust you that you can figure it so let's um, go on with like something like lights. So lights again is the same thing. Configure light, and we we expect or MPF expects like a hardware light object, and it has like a method send set fade, and that does like it has this light to fade to a certain brightness within a certain time. So like in 100 milliseconds, reach full brightness. And as I told initially, that's very different between platforms. So we got certain helpers for lights. So we got one which is called direct fade for, for hardware platforms, which exactly support what we intend. So that's quite a few, like Spike does it exactly the way we imagined it, as if they implemented their platform for MPF. Don't know if they did, but it's nice. Say for like P3 Rock or so. And uh, there's like often a maximum fade time. MPF can then like re-trigger the fade, so that's something it can do. But um, it mostly just passes on the command. And there's like software fade for all the platforms which do not know fades, so which only have a command to set a certain brightness. There we got like software fade, and then MPF will like sample it, so it will send like a command every 10 milliseconds and interpolate between the colors. And additionally, there's a light batch system. It sounds clunky, but what it actually does is um, it orders the lights with a certain function which you can provide. And that's useful because for bandwidth reasons on your bus, a lot of platforms implement some batching so that you can send like the brightness of 10 lights at once. And then you only need to have the command and all the headers and so on. And then you can just have like 20 brightness values or so. And for that reason, we got the light batch system, which gives you gives you like a list of lights. And you can then send them at once. It's very useful in a lot of ways. Um for like yeah, for performance reasons and also for like synchronization reasons. Mm. We can quickly, and uh, yeah, and you can have both at once because a lot of platforms got like GIs and they got modern serial LEDs. And for GIs, they use software fade and direct fade for like um, the RGB lights or the serial lights. So we can again look at the interface. That's like, that will be the last one then. <laughs> uh, then, you're, then we're done with that part here. Um, so a light platform has only light sync that's called like it's if you that's only some some platforms use that that's if you need to sync up stuff and then there's like configure light which expects 
you to return a light platform interface object. And that interface should implement like set fade. That's it. And then there's like those sorting functions, which you do not need to have, but if you want to have light and um, batch light system, then implement those. And this fade has like start brightness, start time, target brightness, and target time. So that's what we give you. And then there are here like some helper implementations which do most of it for you because it's similar but not the same in most platforms. Um, in Lissy, it's like I think they use yeah they use like batch batch uh, light system and batch light a system here and this is configured with like a callback function that's this one send multiple light updates and you can configure a lot of stuff on it and actually what it does it gives you like a sequential list of lights and this you can like do exactly that it then takes all those lights puts them into like a large sequence of bytes and sends off these bytes to the hardware and and it's done so this is really small like in most platforms this is like 500 lines of code because something special <laughs> and that's basically what you need to, to support lights um, it's usually simple and there are yeah that's that's the, the way with fades but just you got different base classes depending on which types types of lights you have and we can also look at configure light um, and here you can see that this actually does that. So depending on your light type, um, it can either be like a modern light or like um, a simple light, other name for old. <laughs> and the old lights, they do not know fades. So they implement light platform software fade. And that then has only a method set brightness and MPF will do like this interpolation stuff for you. So um, and additionally, this lights only know on and off. So like it just checks if brightness is larger than zero, then it's on, otherwise it's off. It's I mean it's simple, but it works. Um and modern lights there's nothing in this class <laughs> except initialization. Uh, so that's what I wanted to show you on platforms. Hope that hasn't been too much. Go back and um, yeah, so I teased it a little bit. So, what do you do if your platform has something special? And most platforms do have something special, which is different. I mean, different doesn't always mean better, <laughs> but at least it's different, it's special. And so, some platforms got they try stuff. And that's fine. That's that's part of innovation. And um, yeah, now your problem is like the MPF interface does not know your fancy shiny feature, which you do not know if anybody's ever going to use it. But you got it. So what do you do? Um, there we got like this platform config dictionary. And this platform config dictionary, which has been like in all these configure interfaces, is something which you can configure in MPF. And it's mostly passed to your platform without much checking. And that's something which you can use to have like custom, like if you have, I don't know, you can configure like the UV color of your light, for example, I don't know. Then you can add that here, for example. And, and that can be, yeah, that can be added there freely on your platform. And usually what we do is like if we see that like, two platforms got something similar, then we add it to the interface so that it's available for everybody. Um, or also like if it can be emulated in software, we also often add it to the interface so that like your platform can do it like in hardware, like fades. And for other platforms, we emulate the behavior so that the feature is still available, but it might be not as nice. For example. It's something we can do. So that's what we do in general. Um, 
it's not totally free because you can, can and should validate what the user puts there. And that also leads us to the next topic, the config validation. So typically your platform needs some kind of like configuration, right? So like which serial port should it use, which baud rate, which USB, or sometimes like, for example, on, on the p -Rock, it's like some ports got different functions. So like you, they can either be a light or they can be a servo or they can be a stepper. And if this is basically something which is exclusive, then it often makes sense to have like a configuration option. So you do not have to validate it during runtime so that MPF does not use both things at once as it usually causes issues. And also you often have to initialize this, this other things at startup. And that usually makes sense to have like some bank configuration or like general stuff. They're often like 10, 15 parameters per platform. And that makes sense to have this in a configuration block for your platform. And usually you put this in the config spec in MPF. And that's basically a way to validate that. And also to have like autocomplete in, in your IDE if you use the MPF language server. And um, additionally, you should like validate the numbers. I teased that earlier. Like if, if the MPF calls configure driver, make sure that the general format of the number is somehow legit and the number makes sense. And if not, tell the user with a reasonable error message how it should look because otherwise they will break support tickets. And it's always easier if the error says, well, try it this way. And then the user usually will try. And I can show you that. So config spec looks like this. Um, so let's, for example, look at the Lizzie section. So there we got like the baud rate. It's a single value, it's an integer, and it has doesn't have any default. Um, there are a few you, you usually want is like debug, debug, high lock, and console lock, basically the lock levels and like if it's debugging on or off. But also like here, maximum LED batch size. I mean, how many LEDs should MPF maxim, maximally batch together and yeah, stuff like that. Um, so that's something you can put here. And uh, you will, there's like a method for it to return how this is called, so like um, the base platform interface, which you usually want to implement, like get config spec, and there you just return how your configuration specification, like, uh, sorry, is it? Yep, like how this section is called, and then MPF will do everything for you, and that's that's it. So that's how you do that. Additionally, for those platform config stuff, which I just told you, you can also have like a validation function for that. And you can return like the name of this config specification Then MPF will validate this for you so that it has the right keys, has the right value type and so on, so that the user will know and start up if, if he got something wrong. So like, I don't know if we got Lizzie switches. Oh, we do not have, but we got like spike switch overrides and for example, maybe fast. Yeah, like fast switches, they got like in debounce open and close time. So we support only debounce, debounce open. So one debounce time in MPF by default, but they got separate times for open and close. So that's something they put there. For the open pinball project, that's the same. So like there's like OPP um, coils, for example, which has like a recycle factor. That's also something which is different. So it's like, that's the multiplier from the pulse time. So it just says, take the recycle time of two times the pulse time. Other, other platforms got like a fixed time there. So that's a little bit different and it's implemented like in this way. Um, yeah, so that's basically how config validation works. Um, and finally, there's like platform registration. So 
how does MPF know that your platform exists? And there are basically two ways. One is like if you want to have an external platform, so if you want to keep your platform separate. And there are few platforms in the on the internet which did not make it like upstream into MPF, usually because like there's one or two bots only and only the creator has it. And they do not want to like sell it or distribute it and therefore it's in their own repository. And you can do that actually with MPF. There's like an, an, a Python module hook, which um, are you? And there's like a demo, demo repository uh, for that in, in our GitHub. And like you do like in your setup pi, you have this entry point section as a Python thingy, and there you can register your platform. I cannot look, you cannot see what I'm showing. Uh, drag it up a little bit. So basically, this entry point stuff here so it tells, tells um, it, it registers on the mpf.platform hook and says the Steamer platform has this import path. That's basically the, the Python module path which MPF should use. And that's what you can use to have like an external platform. There are actually, I think, two active ones on the internet. Um, which is one is called like Fantastic, which is a nice name, and the other one, what? But it's like the one is like they they use a CAN interface and so on. It's super nice. But they I asked them, but they did not want to upstream it because it's just like their project, and they do not want to change to to. I don't know if they don't want to share, but it's not that they're distributing it at the moment. And the other way is like to add it to MPF config. That's the way if you want to like upstream your platform. And I can show you that. It looks like this. So like this is all the platforms we got in MPF here. Uh, so in MPF config, YAML. So let's the whole desktop here. There are all the platforms we got, and then basically the Python path where not a good example. Here, for example, the Open Pinball project here. That's how MPF would load it if you put it into the into your hardware section in MPF. And um, that's basically that's it. If you do it, put it here, it will work in your hardware section, and MPF will load it. And um, un, un, because you wrote perfect code, it will just work on the first try. <laughs> I mean, realistically, put it there and then try it until it works. And so that's actually how you register uh, your, your platform. And yeah, there are like a few platforms here. I'm currently got some hardware laying around here. It's not finished yet. So I will show it probably in a few weeks when everything is fleshed out because we're still discussing like some commands or they could be like more efficient with MPF and so on. But it will like be available for everyone, commercial platform, and um, MPF will obviously support it for all of you. Mm, yeah, so that's generally how it is. So here you can see that like we got like some some interesting platforms, like uh, for example, uh, what's it called? A light segment displays, for example, is an interesting platform because this is basically a platform which is using like lights and implements the, the the segment display platform without having like real hardware. It just uses like the lights in MPF. But it's also like a platform here. A Cobra pin. Cobra pin is basically from MPF perspective. It's just the Open Pinball project. So uh, OPP, that's something you wrote initially, and uh, it has been heavily extended over time. So it's uh, one of the platforms with a lot of features. So, um, so what can the OPP hardware platform can be lights, switches, and drivers at the moment. So that's it. Um, but uh, it has like a whole lot of those the wings, uh, which are like it can have each CPU on the Open Pinball project. I mean, I did a stream a few weeks back about it. 
but each CPU can have four wings and each wing can be either lights or drivers or bows or switches or bows or three of them. I don't know, there, there are multiple like configurations. And this is something like those are like the three, you know, where is it? We can find it somewhere. Um so but it can be multiple things and we have to enumerate that and then configure everything. So there's like a lot of code here. And Cobra pin is like not, from an MPF perspective, it's not special. It's just like opinionated hardware. So it's bought with an OPP processor, which has like specific configuration and MPF will just read this configuration, will know, well, it has like, I don't know, 16 coils or something and 64 switches or something and a few lights and so on. And then MPF will just expose those lights and switches and based on like like on this enumeration. So that's something that's basically here, connect to hardware. It gets all the serial ports because they're like two CPUs on the Cobra pin, for example, so it will connect to both CPUs and um, yeah, connect to them and then have firmware check i think it's somewhere early here and reads ids identification chain what 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 there's a lot of stuff i'm going read initial switches and yeah yeah a lot of stuff so that's what it will do and uh, then it does a lot of Validation also, but I mean the Cobra pin. I guess uh, you you get the idea. It's just yeah, two serials via USB, and then it enumerates those CPUs, and it will then yeah be used like from the logical switches and coils in MPF, and that's how this works. So yeah, serial communicator, and then communicate. And then like there are like a lot of methods here which can be received. And I think it's like it's an inventory, yeah, inventory response here. And that well yeah, this is here. Here just so, like we pass the board configuration here. And there we know like if it's a solenoid wing, then we know that we got those switches. If it's like an input wing, we got those. If it's an incandescent wing, like this, like the old lights, it's only yeah this one and which mat matrix neo pixels like serial LED, eyesight incandescent, and what else? There's like a lot of stuff here, <laughs> and then we configure all of that and send a lot of commands and expose the hardware and everybody's happy hopefully um one more thing i can show is like if you did this and you want to do a really great job it's just if it's already it's good if it works but it's great if you already test i also test it and um, i will show you now like for dizzy for example or let, let's go for the open pinball project um so what you can do is like, what you should do and can do is you should implement some tests. And that's basically an integration test with your hardware platform. That's helpful because, for example, if I'm now maintaining the code and refactoring stuff, it's useful to have like an integration test where I can actually check that the hardware is still working. I might have the hardware, but I also might not have it. But I cannot like have test every change with like ten with test ten different hardware platforms because that would be like require a lot of space and so on and and time for especially. So what we recommend or also what we actually got for all hardware platforms is like a test. And this test usually um does some way to mock like the connection to the hardware. For example, in the Open Pinball project case, we got like built-in mocking of serial ports because like 
I would say 80, 90 percent of our platforms use some kind of serial. You got a way to mock serial ports here, and then you got like a virtual serial. And um, now the platform is set up in the beginning. That's basically when MPF initializes everything. And there we say, well, we expect those commands here to be sent. And here's usually documented what they do and what the response should like. For example, here, the board response that's got like those types of wings. That's what I just told, right? With the, with the wings, this firmware version, whatever. And now here we pass on control to MPF, to initialize everything. And at the end, we make sure that the platform has been loaded and all the commands have been sent. And it will like assert and crash or fail the test if something else has been sent. That, will, that way we can make, change that, uh, make sure that no matter what we did, the platform still sends the same commands. And the theory is like if we send the same commands, it should also behave the same way. Um, and yeah, like here we check a lot of stuff and then there are tests which do like, for example, um, for example, we test lights here. So we call command on a light, turn this light to red, and then we expect that this command is actually sent to the hardware. And we then check that it happens and we check it for all kind of different commands here, for I don't know, different colors, different fades and so on. And this actually tests also that this batching works so that we can set two sequential lights and it will only send one command and not two separate ones. For example, if you want that to happen, test it. If it ain't tested, consider it broken. And we do this for like different firmware versions here and different board versions because in, there's like, that's a, that has been like an evolution or like. Um, evolution of the hardware, so like that, like from firmware 0.1 to 2.2. So there have been like I don't know a lot of versions in between. We can check like switch states. We can check basically anything here virtually because this will like run really really fast. Like this test might take like 200 milliseconds or so. So you can run it like every time you change something, and we also run it like in the continuous integration in, on, on GitHub before any pull requests so we can make sure that we do not break your hardware. And that's something which paired us really well in the past. So we got like a high like stability on tested stuff. So we rarely break stuff which is tested. We usually just break stuff if it's not tested and then well then it's usually a good idea to, to add a test. And yeah, for hardware rules, for whatever. So that's basically also like my my closing words. I would say just test everything. It's also faster to develop it with a test and not with like real hardware because that will just take a lot more time to start it up, check it on real hardware, then go back and so on. It's faster to have a test and just test it virtually against like your specification, and then you can make sure that your hardware actually comes to your specification because Sometimes documentation isn't perfect, but at least you will know afterwards. So that's uh, what I would recommend there. And, and that's also like um, the last thing I got. So unless you got any more questions, I'm happy to answer if you got some. And we can look into like any platform you want. And, or if you got any questions, any particular questions on particular special hardware and then you can ask them and uh, if not i guess i would like like wrap it up and um, yeah if you yeah if you're hacking again so <laughs> we have to take, take your time and with my like slides here <laughs> uh yeah hope I hope this has been like um, informative for you and uh, hope it will help people in the future to uh, like implement, get an idea how to implement stuff. I mean, uh, hi, Freezy, and thanks for, for joining. And yeah, I, I hope that this is like a reference to 
get a starting point to how, how to implement this. And um, yeah, if you like it, uh, what's called like, please is subscribe and I don't know what it's called. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I will be back like on Saturday with like a stream on probably on state machines and MPF. So how you use like the state, state machine for logic and implement your custom mode logic there and why it's powerful, why it's cool, why it's awesome computer science stuff, which is super easy once you understand it, but super scary if you have never heard about it. But that would be fun, hopefully. And um, until then, I wish you like, um, yeah, an, an awesome remaining week. Maybe see you on Saturday. And until then, have a great time.